When I Have Fears by John Keats When I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high piled books in character hold like rich garners the full ripened grain, when I behold upon the night's starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance, and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance, and when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love. Then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think, to love and fame, to nothingness, do sink. Well, um, this poem by Keats, it was published about 30 years after his death. Um, it's very moving, obviously it's about mortality, about contemplation of one's own death. Um, but I think there's a number of interesting things going on here that often get overlooked. The, let's talk about some of the imagery first. Three, three really clear, striking images. The first one is, in the first four lines, the idea of um, the teeming brain um, and the books that are the product of that, the whole process of writing, because it's very much a personal poem. He's looking at his own brain, the books he might write. Um, they are like stores of grain. So he's comparing the, the, the thought process, the creative writing process, to uh, something in nature, the cycles of nature, where um, the seed will grow all the way through the seasons and ripen and become the finished grain at the end. So he's linking in a parallel process creativity, particularly the poet's own job specifically, with the cycles of nature. So that link between nature and um, and the poet's work, very, very strong idea in romanticism. The second idea, um, again, is the use of nature. In the night sky, um, in lines five to nine, where he talks about there being huge clou uh, cloudy symbols of a high romance in the night sky. So he's looking up and he's seeing symbols. He's seeing uh, a language. He's seeing something which is maybe the language of nature, which the um, poet's job is to decipher. Um, what's striking about that is that the entire world is something that, to a romantic poet, is something that can is, is just waiting to be revealed. So uh, he uses the verb to trace, and he talks about tracing um, the shadows of these symbols in the night sky. And that word trace very interesting idea about creativity. The poet's job is to tune into nature and to copy what's already there. So it's not that process of inventing something that comes from within. It's about just picking up on the symbols that are out there in the world already, already present, and just tuning into what's already there. Kind of the language of nature, which is just waiting to be revealed. The next image, the third and final key image that I want to talk about, is the one at the end where he sees himself as being very isolated on the shore. It's a very um, moving, sad, uh, dreamlike image. And what I want to notice there is the idea of the shore. It's interesting because it's what's called a liminal space. It's a boundary space between land and sea. It's a place of uh, crossings, of thresholds, of boundaries, um, and it's empty other than uh, the poet himself there, the narrator, is the only um, person there, which is why it perhaps feels a bit a bit dreamlike. Um, it's a place where all values seem to disappear. He talks about love and fame to nothingness do sink in the final line. And that might seem, at first reading, a very gloomy, uh, almost depressing idea that in contemplating uh, death and mortality, we know that Keats uh, famously died very young, um, of, I think we'd call it TB, it was called consumption back then. He, were, he was somebody who, who perhaps might be looking in this poem at death in a rather gloomy way, but I want to give you a very different take on that, which is he's standing there alone and all the values like love and fame sink away to nothingness. It's actually about oblivion. It's about reaching a state, almost like a zen-like state, where none of the things that have driven him through his life, love and fame specifically, he died as a young man, so love and passion was very much the center of kind of his, his, his life. 
uh, and the fame as a writer, you know, one of the most precocious, talented young writers in the history of English literature, that, that quest for love and for fame that dictated his life and that presumably actually was quite stressful, uh, it was a self-induced pressure on him, he's liberated from it by concentrating on his own death in this poem, in that meditative way, he's strangely set free from it. Um, so there is that typical interpretation of this poem that it's actually quite a bleak poem. It's one that sends a shiver down the spine, but there's a different way of looking at it, which is that um, when all those things that we've aspired for, that drive us, that give us, if you like, that creative tension have gone, we're actually at a certain t type of piece. So it doesn't have to be seen as a depressing poem. It doesn't have to be seen as a, um, as a dark poem even. It's one about reaching a point of tranquility. And I think you can hear that in the rhythms of the lines as well. So you've got a, a Shakespearean Elizabethan type sonnet here with three quatrains and a couplet at the end. The lovely balance of the lines, the rhythm of it all the way through, it reaches a very gentle kind of peace. So the words and the sounds both reach a kind of um, level of tranquility which is actually liberating rather than depressing.